Good evening, everyone. Welcome to the Cape Elizabeth Town Council um, meeting of August 10th, 2015. Would you please join me in the Pledge of Allegiance? I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you very much. And we would uh, like the roll call by the town clerk, please. Chairman Ray. Here. Councilor Brennan. Councilor Jordan. Here. Councilor McCausland. Here. Councilor Sullivan. Here. Councilor Wagner. Present. And Councilor Walsh. Here. Thank you very much. Uh, moving on to town council reports and correspondence. Does everyone have anything they'd like to say? Jessica? Yep. I, uh, I uh, really enjoyed the Night of Delight. It was a wonderful, wonderful evening. I would like to make two corrections, though, and that is it is not a state park. It is Fort Williams Park, <laughs> owned by the town of Cape Elizabeth. And it is free because that is the wish of the people of the town of Cape Elizabeth. Thank you. Anyone else? Jim. I would like to thank the, uh, the town of Cape Elizabeth and its employees uh, for working with the TD Beach to Beacon Road Race to host another fantastic event. And uh, it was just an amazing day. And uh, I think I'm the only one who ran the race on the town council. So I can say from somebody who ran the race, I bettered my time by 12 minutes. Ooh. So I'm a happy camper. At my age, that's a good thing. But anyway, I, I think the uh, town employees deserve an incredible round of applause for what they were able to do again for 18 years straight, put on a really first-class event, and um, people of Cape Elizabeth should be very proud, and I thank them. Thank you, Jim. Anyone else? Molly? I have an update for appointments, which I know is on the agenda. Right. I don't want to step in if anybody I was just going to first. I was going to move to you, but I was waiting to see if anybody else had anything. No? Nope. All right, then. Molly. Oh, I'm sorry. I, I can go after Molly. Do you want to go now? Because hers is scheduled after. Oh, yeah. Sorry. I just wanted to report that the Solid Waste and Recycling Long Range Planning Committee is um, completing its draft of its report and will be submitting it on time at the end of this month. Great. Thank you very much. Molly, you're up. Two quick things. The first one is I could be wrong, but my calendar says today is Jessica's birthday. So oh, yes. happy birthday. Happy birthday, Ooh. Jessica. Thank you. <laughs> happy birthday. And the second thing I wanted to report in on was the um, recommendation from the Appointments Committee that we are planning to have a public input session on September 17th. It will be held at the middle school, 7 p.m. We have heard from people for, I don't know, as long as I have been on the council that um, the council needed to provide some kind of a forum or a better way or a better process of seeking input on the goals for the council work and a better process for disseminating the information about those goals. So our expectation is that on that meeting on September 17th, we'll be meeting in the middle school, 7 p.m. We'll be looking for your input. We'll try to give a brief update on how the process has worked in the past and how we're anticipating the evening will go and then we'll probably have some sort of a very brief agenda with some specific topics that we'd like some input on and then have a, a broader discussion. Um, I'm imagining, although we have not worked out the logistics yet, I'm imagining that it will be a form kind of similar to what we used in the library discussions where we <coughs> set up tables of six or eight or ten people at each group and um, had people work together as a team to think about brainstorming and get the ideas back to one central location at the end of the evening. And we will look forward to getting your input and your guidance. And again, I'll just say it, September 17th, 7 p.m. at the middle school. Thank you. Thank you, Molly. Yep. Um, then we will move on to uh, the Finance Committee report. 
Uh, first of all, there is no dashboard. Um, we're a month into the new fiscal year, so we don't have a whole lot to report. Um, so there's no dashboard. So if you've been looking for it, as I have been, uh, it's not there. Uh, you have attached, however, is the July 31st, 2015 financial reports. Remember, that's the 27 plus page I exam. Uh, and you're welcome to take a look at that with any questions. Um, other than that, I have nothing else to report. Thank you, Jim. Any <coughs> questions for Jim? No? Okay, then we will move on to a citizen opportunity for discussion of items not on the agenda. So this is not on the agenda. If you'd like to say something to the council, please come up to the podium, give us your name and address, and you have three minutes. Hi, I'm Paul Seidman. I live at 21 Oakview Drive. Uh, I wanted to address the matter of uh, an upcoming discussion on the new Village Green Multiplex project. Um, as I've been looking over documents for the last two years, uh, a critical step has been bypassed, which is clearly defining what the substantial public benefit is uh, for moving forward, even with a plan. Uh, we had a plan two years ago that was, um, in terms of the schematic, was basically identical and it required changing a wetland ordinance and the public rejected it. We have a new plan um, or a resurrected plan that now requires other law change in order to pass, even though the public would, in terms of what the public has said in the past about what they didn't like about it, that remains to be true. You can use the 2012 FOSS uh, survey to identify that. Um, but another concern is that the language has shifted from 1993 till now from uh, identifying public interest in a central gathering place to a village green in town center to a village green multiplex project next to town hall. Uh, and now that plus um, the developer saying, we need you to change a setback law in order for this project to move forward. And that was his request at a last uh, public uh, planning board meeting. Thank you. Thank you. Is there anyone else? Items not on the agenda? Seeing none, then we will move on uh, to the town manager's Kathy, monthly report. Oh, I'm sorry. Is there any way we can get a correction to the statement that was made that the the public rejected the wetland issue with the lot next door. I mean, I, I'd, I'd like to have the record corrected because I'm not sure that's correct. Is that possible? Did you want to? I, you know, I, I don't remember all the details of it. Uh, you know, maybe the minutes could reflect that you you objected to that statement and uh, that uh, you you. Are you asking for a report or? Well, I just think that, I mean, I see that Maureen is here and I, I, she's closer to it than all of us, but I think the bottom line here is I'd like to make sure that the record is corrected because I do not believe that the public rejected that wetland issue in the lot next door. And I just, maybe I've lost it, but I don't remember that being a public issue, frankly. I think it was taken out of there either by the developer or in some other fashion. So, so let the re record reflect I disagree with the statement made. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Jim. <clears throat> uh, okay. Town manager's monthly report. Yes. Uh, thank you. I just want to uh, briefly mention that Matt Sturgis, the, the assessor, has been working on the annual tax commitment. And some of you may have seen stories in some of the other newspapers or about other communities <clears throat> ended up getting some additional school subsidy. Uh, Cape Elizabeth was no different from those other communities. Uh, we ended up getting additional state school subsidy. When the council adopted the budget, uh, one of the paragraphs in the budget uh, was that uh, if there was additional state subsidy, that that would go 100% to the reduction of taxes. So uh, what would otherwise you know, be taxed? And the taxes that are being committed today, was it today or tomorrow? Do you know, Deb? I think today. Today. Uh, actually, uh, when, when the council had approved the budget, it was premised there was going to be a 32 cent tax increase. As it turns out, it's going to be 8 cents. And that, you know, 24 cent shift uh, is, is because of the main legislature uh, adopting a new budget that did provide for 
additional school funding beyond what uh, everyone did. So that the tax, so the bottom line is the tax rate this year, despite the new library and the new debt and all that, is one half of one percent, uh, uh, or eight cents per thousand. So. Uh, everyone has the tax bills to look forward to uh, Thank you. coming out uh, just in the next uh, few days. Thank you, Mike. Thank you very much. That's great. Your, uh, and is that it? That's it. All right. Yeah. Then uh, we'll move on to the review of the draft minutes for the July 13th meeting. Is there a motion to approve? Jessica? I so move. Thank you. Is there a second? Thank you, Molly. Discussion? Errors, omissions, changes? No? All in favor? 6 0. Great. Moving on to item 97 the Ocean House Pizza liquor license renewal. Um, I guess I would ask Deborah if there are any issues that we should be aware of. Uh, no, as we do, we review each liquor license with uh, codes for our police, and there have been no objections or questions uh, with this renewal for the malt and minus liquor license. Thank you. Is there a motion to accept? Jamie? So moved. Thank you. Is there a second? Seconded. Jim, thank you. Um, any discussion? No. Oh, all in favor? 6-0. Okay, moving on to item 98, um, the recommendation from the Fire Range Committee. Caitlin, would you like to give us a little overview? Um, at our last meeting, the Fire Range Committee submitted uh, seven findings and four recommendations. Included in those recommendations were two recommendations that had to do with the safety evaluation that the town council requested to be done on the Spur and Grod and Gun Club. Um, at last month's meeting, we set our public hearing to discuss the Swearing Garden Guns Club application for next month so that this month we could receive information from that independent safety evaluation evaluator that is going to be here tonight to present to us what his findings were. Great. Thank you very much. Okay. So um, I will then move on to the um, presentation by Rick LaRosa who um, is here and did the safety evaluation. Um, Mr. LaRosa, if you'd come up to the uh, podium. Do you want to indicate when the public's been going to be out this week? Yes, um, well, I was just about to do that. Um, what I'm suggesting to folks in the room is that <coughs> Mr. LaRosa is going to give his report. Uh, counselors, write down questions that you have so not, we're not interrupting the report as he gives it. Um, after he gives his report, we will take public comments, and then we will go to the council questions. Is that all right for the counselors? So we try to keep some flow going. So, Mr. LaRosa, if you would introduce yourself. Sure, sure, sure. T uh, tell us a little about your qualifications and what you were asked to do, and you give us your presentation. Thank you very much. Well, thanks for having me up. Thanks for uh, the great welcome. And uh, the weather is beautiful up here. Um, my name is Rick LaRosa. I, I own a company called Our Design Works. We're commercial architects. And I'm licensed in uh, Maine also. We're licensed all across the country. We have products going on all over the, the country right now. Um, just by quick way of introduction, I'll just tell you a little bit about myself because I'm a guy from Georgia who, you know, nobody knows. And uh, you're probably wondering who I am and why this all happened. Um, I'm, I was born and raised in Omaha, Nebraska. I lived there until 85, uh, 55 years old. Um, uh, married my wife uh, there. Uh, we met after college in a musical. Uh, we were guys and dolls, and I was Sky Masterson, and she was Sister Sarah. And we're uh, so anyway, we're, uh, we fell in love on stage, and and uh, I sing uh, as a hobby. I've sung for boy close to 40 years since I was a high school freshman in a barbershop quartet. Uh, we're actually international champs. Uh, we won in 1999, and uh, yeah, so, so I have a great hobby like that. Uh, in Georgia, um, we live on, so we moved to Georgia. We have two kids. Uh, I'm now a grandparent. Uh, they just had twins about a year ago, and uh, to a boy and a girl. And uh, we have a son who's an FAA tra air traffic controller in Memphis. Um, we moved to Georgia with an international firm, worked for the Corps of Engineers for a year as an architect. Uh, then 
moved to Georgia, an international firm, Leo Daly, opened an office there, and I ran their office, was with them for about 20 years. Ran architects, engineers, interior designers. And after that, I went to work for a construction company because we were doing design-build work and uh, learned the construction side of the business. So kind of learned about what things cost and how contractors make money and all that side. And in 2004, I opened up our own company. So a little over 11 years ago, we, we started... Uh, our design firm, and we were architect-led design build, so we were actually building projects, a very diverse practice. Uh, I'm not lobbying for work up here, but we do all sorts of stuff. Um, part of that practice then became uh, kind of involved a, a gun company in Atlanta, in Smyrna, Georgia, there's a company called uh, Glock. Glock is an international firm, Austrian, uh, Hershiser and all the gang up there. They have their U.S. headquarters in Atlanta, and we won the contract to, dis to work with Glock on the next expansion of their campus. And that expansion involved tactical ranges and manufacturing facilities and corporate offices, and it was a, it was a lot of stuff uh, that we had to go to school on. Some of it was like, all right, what are we doing here? How do we, what does that mean? And they talked about confidential work, uh, a rifle instead of just their handgun. So it was. So we, we got to know a lot about Glock and therefore we got to know a lot about handguns and, and rifles and gun ranges and uh, police forces and from that work and that experience which was extensive and we're still doing to this day, it's, it's probably got a nine year history with Glock of doing work. Um, from that history, it kind of brought us to other ranges in the southeast. We started getting calls for ranges in Florida and ranges in, in Georgia and Alabama and such, military ranges, uh, indoor ranges, outdoor ranges, big ranges, small ranges, remedi remediations and new ranges and stuff like that. And, you know, so this is the economy's kind of tilting a little bit at this point and we're still kind of going strong because the gun range industry was going, as well as we have got a great client base. Um, that led us to uh, being noticed by the NRA, I guess, more than anything. So this, I just want to make sure you know this isn't something that we just went out and became gun center central. We, we kind of learned about this and inherited uh, the, the, the gun practice, the gun business, um, as a project type. The NRA uh, noticed that we knew a lot about guns at this point, and, and gun ranges specifically. Um, and just while I said I, we know a lot about guns, listen, I'm, a, I, I'm, a gun, I, I'm not a crazy gun guy. I sing. Uh, my my big hobby is astronomy. We have the largest telescope in Georgia and the largest private observatory on top of a hill where we look at Tennessee and North Carolina and Georgia. So, I, you know, I own a gun. Uh, I like guns, but I didn't come in. I'm an Eagle Scout. My son's an Eagle Scout. I was on the executive board of the Boy Scouts. Um, so lots of, you know, lots of that kind of stuff in my history, but I'm just not like this raw, raw gun guy. So when the, when the NRA called, uh, it was like, okay, well, this is a gun group, right? They're all, all about guns. So they wanted us to look at their design manual. They wanted us to look at uh, other projects. And from there, we started to go more national in terms of our involvement with gun ranges and doing evaluations and such from all the experience that we've had locally in the Southeast. So to date, we've probably done uh, 25 evaluations. Uh, some of those have recommendations. Some of those just result in uh, improvements, some of those result in relocating ranges. Uh, we probably got 50 gun ranges, indoors, outdoor, tactical, police, military, private, you know, but we, we just finished a range uh, for Research Triangle. Um, it's a total containment range. We just finished a range down in Florida that has a restaurant and a bar attached. So as, as crazy as that sounds, and it is crazy, sounds crazy, um, you know, I, I guess the the right thing to think about is that, well, that's no different than somebody coming off the street and they're you know, capable of firing a gun. You've got to know that then, too. I mean, so anyway, the guy was an ex-Marine and wanted to do this kind of thing. So, so qualification-wise, uh, you know, for the past nine years or so, we've been working in the gun industry, in gun range design industry. Uh, we have many more products going on now. Uh, Colorado, um, two new ones up here in Maine. Uh, Indiana, Pennsylvania. Uh, Oregon, California, Nebraska, and we just have, so there's lots of, there's lots of this going on around the country, and it's, it's the concern of, uh, it's, it's my concern as much as anybody's, and believe me, when we wrote the report, I, I, if I'm wondering, but if I'm not covering what you need me to cover, let me know. When we wrote the report um, and recommended that the range fire be suspended, 
uh, one of the first calls I got was from the NRA. And, uh, you know, saying, hey, you know we're not in the closing gun range business, right? <laughs> I, I said, yeah, I, yeah I, I, I know that. But, uh, you know, I just want to let you know I'm not beholden to anybody. I mean, this isn't, this isn't uh, uh, the, the council did a great job of kind of saying, you know, don't talk to the range, don't talk to us, don't just go out there and tell us what you see. And, and I did that. And uh, I did that without the NRA's input and anybody else's. I just said, you know, this is a, this is a situation where I, I think it calls for us to take a step back. Um, it's in absolutely everybody's interest to have a safe range. Uh, I, I, I mean, I just totally believe that. There's no reason that you would ever want to do anything less than have a safe range. Um, and I think it's in the gun range owner's interest. It's in, it's in your interest. It's in the NRA's interest. It's in my interest. It's in the city's interest. And so everything we can do to, to make the gun range safe, and if it's not safe, we've got to evaluate, if, is it safe enough? Which, you know, you're talking about ballistics that travel from one and a half to three miles very fast and uh, have deadly force behind them. So when you kind of get to that, you kind of say, you know what, let's take a little time out here. Let's make sure things are going right. When we looked at the Sperlink, uh, I hope I'm saying that right, the Sperlink gun range, um, it had residents that had come, right or wrong, after the fact, and they were now in the line of fire, and they were there too close. And uh, just to give you a quick sense of angles of elevation here, so I stepped off at the very first of the meeting from that back wall where Chief and Paul are sitting, where that picture's at, to this wall is about 60 feet. Proportionally, that angle of, of incline, and you can imagine, we're not, we're not designing, we don't want to design a range that if everything's right and the wind's right and everything's real stable and everything's down, that, that the fire is going to go just where you want it to. We design ranges so that if there's an accident, if, if this one goes like that and then the next one goes like that, that's what you want to do. You want to have that a safe range. So, um, so that distance, 60 feet, is equivalent if you were to take, let's say, where Chief's at. So he's sitting down there at the, at the uh, uh, wainscot, the uh, chair rail height, right, which is the same height as this back here. The range of incident that's, that's coming from the firing line and elevation for it to clear the, the ridge, so to speak. If there weren't trees, I know it's deciduous and there's a lot of lumber and stuff like that, but if, if you were to clear the ridge, it would be the top of the Cape Elizabeth sign. So that's a, that's a small little margin of error there. You know, if you, get, if you had a gun there and you were supposed to aim it at the top of the chair rail, if it just ended up pointing to the top of the Cape Elizabeth sign, it would clear the, the ridge of the hill. And ballistics, you know, as we were looked at for the range there, the ballistics were, at the time, too large. There was a lot of stuff. They were firing all the way from 22s and, and such up to 0.7 double lot nitros. So there was, a lot of, there was a lot of power that could have possibly happened there. So we just looked at that and said, you know, this is probably not a good safe situation. And uh, whether it's never happened in the past or whether it happens tomorrow, nobody wants to be on the side of, of a report or a range where there's an accident. Uh, and I know that there's never, happened, there's never had an accident, but you don't want to be there. So we just said, this is time, and I struggled. You know, I just kind of said, this is the time to write a report and say, we need to, we need to stop fire right now and, and get a handle on the safety of this range to make sure that everybody understands that. So um, in a nutshell, that's kind of what we did. So we wrote a report and ran uh, numbers and took pictures and walked and analyzed and went back to our books and looked at the ballistics and looked at the maintenance of the range, stuff like that, and, uh, and recommended that the, the range be suspended. Now, I know uh, from having done this all across the country that, and I sat over here, but I, it, somebody said it was like the bride and the groom of which <laughs> I, uh, you know, I have. I have no idea. I don't know whose side I'm on. You know, I'm not, I'm not anybody's side. I'm on the side of safety. That's all I want. So the, the point is, though, I guess, that uh, coming into a meeting like this, you know, I'm hero to half and I'm enemy of the other half, right? And as long as it stays like that, then I'm loved and hated by whoever has, an, has those opinions and agendas. Mr. LaRosa, um, can you speak right into the microphone yes, so everybody can hear you? I just, I'm used to that barbershop stage. I understand. I just, 
<laughs> understand. So, and and you're, you should address the oh, I know, I know. <laughs> Thank you. Anyway, sorry. And we, we, if we could get some, maybe, a, maybe an overview of more specifics. Just of? Of the, of the report, some of the, report, some yeah, of the more specifics. If he, could, if he could go through it as, I mean, if the rest of the council agrees, Chairman Ray. So anyway, to be more specific on the report. Um, Thank you. For a, number of, for a number of issues on the existing range, I recommended that they suspe suspend fire. Um, I, I do not think there is anything there that can't be corrected. I don't, you know, we design ranges as, uh, as do another couple uh, groups around the country, and there's nothing that can't be overcome. Uh, we currently are designing a range in Research, tri uh, research Triangle, uh, another one, that uh, there is a bioengineering $40 million uh, land purchase, $180 million building firm coming from Sweden. They want to make sure anything doesn't leave the range. Uh, gunfire should not leave the property, and it certainly should not leave the containment of the range. So between the maintenance, the ballistics, the uh, angles of incident, the topography, all those things, uh, those are the things that we saw in our range report that we said we need to suspend fire. Uh, not to say that they, again, they can't be corrected, they, they will be corrected, shouldn't be corrected, all that kind of stuff, but um, at this point I think it's the right recommendation. And we weren't influenced by anybody. Great. Thank you very much. I'm sure the council will have questions, but I'm going to move. That's great. Thank you. I'm going to move to the public comment, okay. and then I'm sure you'll be here for additional uh, questions. Um, so before I move to the public comment, um, I want to remind people that there's no applause or otherwise expression of approval or disapproval um, of any statements made or actions taken. So I just want to remind folks of that so we're not hearing some cheering and some excitement and so forth, because it makes it hard for people who might have a differing opinion to speak. So having said that, um, I'll remind the council that we normally would give 15 minutes, but we may be looking for more. So just so that you're prepared for that. Um, and the same rules apply, three minutes, Please come to the podium, state your name and address, and I'm going to be timing you. Thank you. Hello. My name is Tammy Walter. I, am, I live at 1095 Sawyer Road, Cape Elizabeth, Maine. Um, I'm the president of the Spurring Broad and Gun Club. Um, I want to thank the community for your outpouring of support during this difficult time while our range has been suspended for live fire. It is extremely touching to have people not connected to our club or shooting sports offer words of kindness and encouragement. I also want to thank my members for your continued, consistent, passionate support. This setback has only made us stronger. I also want to thank the council and everyone who is here tonight who came out to support us. Our intention is and always has been to have a facility that remains safe and that all of us can be proud of. Thank you. Next. Hello, I'm Mark Mayone, past president, Spurwink Ron and Gun Club. Three years ago, we started a modernization program at the club. It has not been without its difficulties. I may not agree with some of the points of the range evaluation, but I do believe that the range evaluation will make us stronger going forward. Thank you. Thank you. Next. And if there's other people, if you could sort of start to queue up so we're not sort of waiting for you to walk from the very back to the beginning, because there may be <coughs> others that want to speak. Hi, Eric Stephanus to Tiger Lily Lane. I just want to say I think it was uh, extremely refreshing to hear a fact-based analysis from a you know, professional range evaluator, such as Mr. LaRosa, um, and I want to commend the council for having the foresight to you know, insist upon the professional evaluation before going, going ahead to uh, review the application. Um, the club has always uh, you know, insisted or uh, assured us that, they, that safety was one of their primary concerns. So although I am sympathetic to uh, the fact that they have been suspended, I think they ought to be, as are we, very thankful, once again, that a fact-based uh, analysis has been carried out. I think this gives us all a great deal of comfort. Um, and, the, and we can perhaps get away from the constant um, uh, t discussing 
issues which are not directly related to the, the, um, the operation of the club, issues like who was there first and why was Cross Hill developed, why did, why did that development go forward, or what is the um, role of, uh, you know, the club as part of Cape Elizabeth's heritage, even though many of the members are not Cape Elizabeth residents anymore, et cetera, et cetera. Those things can be discussed, you know, ad nauseum. But we can get away from that now, thank heavens, and just look at the facts. What's safe? And I hope you make a, uh, you know, a, uh, a determination on the application based on the facts. Thank you very much. Thank you. Is there anyone else? No? Okay. Well, seeing none then, um, I will move it along then to counselors' questions. And would you like to have Mr. LaRosa come back up? Mr. LaRosa, could you come back up so you can answer specific questions of the counselors? Thank you. Uh, I think Jim had his hand up first. Jim? Um, I don't know whether, um, whether Rick has had a chance to see the recommendations of the Fire and Range Committee, but um, there were two specific um, recommendations that were made by the Fire and Range Committee who um, uh, basically wanted you to comment on the design phasing plan as you understand it, and in particular as it relates to 100% shot containment. And I wondered if you have any thoughts about that. Yeah, first, I have not seen the range committee recommendations. Unless they were sent to me, I do not recognize those. But I don't remember receiving anything from the council or. I wouldn't expect that you did. I just okay. That's all. Um, so if. I, you'll probably need to refresh my, me in terms of what the question you're looking for. The, the design that should be done, would be done, to, or, or the ones that the club has proposed? It's the ones that the club has proposed. Gotcha. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. Um, yeah. So, you know, basically the club's proposal was uh, some bin block type walls and some ballistic rubber attached to that and uh, some rubber berming and things. And it did not address fully the need for containment. Um, so, you know, they are, they are needing, as I specified in the report, they are needing to get together with a designer and, uh, and have the, the rest of their plan completed, not only in terms of safety and procedures and, you know, all that kind of stuff, but also the design of the range itself. Uh, more baffling, more containment on the sidewalls, uh, better berm, all those kind of things. And, you know, again, it's, it's easy to do. We do this all over the country. Uh, but it, it's, it was not currently in the plan as they presented it. Okay. And then the second question that uh, we raised was um, your opinion of the design of the club compared to standards uh, that are used by the NRA. Uh, same, the same, same answer, basically. Mm -hmm. um, the design that, that they were proposing was not uh, as is recommended by the NRA. And it's not how we practice range design right now. So that's, that's uh, is that uh, universally held by the, the industry the, that's not acceptable or the NRA? Cor correct. Government? Yeah, I would say the, the plan they have currently would not be acceptable for containment. Correct. Okay. So the phasing that the club had gone and used up to now, because there's been a lot of money invested over the last several years, as Mark Mayon commented initially, as you look at that investment in relationship to what shot containment should be, were there a lot of dollars being spent maybe inappropriately or not well? Yeah, I, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't go that far. I mean, I, I think they're doing lots of things that are needed as far as the overall gestalt of the plan, um, but they need some bigger elements in terms of overhead containment. Um, a lot of what their plan entailed was <coughs> side berm and end wall containment. Uh, we needed a, a typical range design, a better range design would have much more overhead containment, trying to eliminate, as you referred to, blue sky, stuff mm -hmm. like that. So. And they shared with you that their goal was to have blue sky done by 2017? Uh, correct. Yeah, I think if, if I could refer to my, the report, the documents that they sent to me indicated a, a phased approach to uh, limiting blue sky, but it was much, much slower and longer than I felt was safe at the time. And the, and the, and the recommendation on eliminating live 
um, versus that containment, containment, and then allow for live. Correct. Okay. Yeah, you have correct. to have containment in order to have. Correct. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. All right. Thank you. Sorry about that. In this situation, I think it's best. They don't have they don't have five miles behind them that's open and nobody's there. I think they need some containment. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. I'm sorry. Was it? Did you have? I think Caitlin was first. Caitlin oh, was first. Okay. Just a question off of what you just said um, about the no blue sky and the timeline. Is it? I guess. And just forgive me for my lack of good words, but is it bad design or is it too long of a design? Do you get what I mean? Like. If that design that they have for their long-range plan could be implemented quicker, is the design an okay design, or do they need to totally rethink the whole project? I think they need to complete the design. It's not, it's not complete. Um, their design does not have any overhead baffles. It needs overhead <coughs> baffles. Um, so no matter how long you would have taken to implement that plan, or how quickly you implement the plan that had been presented to us, okay. it would not have been a successful plan for containment. Um, but a successful plan for containment can be made. It's just not that plan as it stands. It needs to be added to. They got a good start, but it's not complete. Jessica, you were next. Yep. Uh, I think the report is not numbered, but mm. after the page after the first graphic, um, until the steps are begun or implemented, we recommend the city of Cape Elizabeth request the existing range to get discontinue use of any live fire. The reasons are as follows. I'd like you to, if you would, address number two. I think I know what you're talking about, but it has to do with trajectory needed to exit the proper, property of only being five degrees. My, my take on that is that the land and the berms around are not high enough to, if somebody points a weapon, and does that I presume that's what you're saying. That is correct, yeah. And, and referring kind of back to the illustration I used about the walls here, that's kind of what I was trying to illustrate was that um, from our calculations, and there was no um, surveyed result that said, here is the elevation of 90 and here's 80 and it goes drop down to 70. We did uh, a lot of analysis trying to determine what was going on around the neighborhood and the houses and distances and and from driving it, from satellite imagery, from GIS of the county, from everything we could determine, uh, this, the graphics that's shown in our, in our report on several of the sections we cut, as well as the plan and other diagrams, that's about as accurate as anybody can get it right now. Uh, and I think it's pretty accurate. I don't think we're way off. But what that indicates is that from the elevation of the firing line, which is about, if you were to put it in broad terms, 20, uh, to the elevation of the top ridge, which is, I could refer to my notes, but it's basically a five degree angle, you know, five, five degrees, 8.6%, uh, I remember. So that angle is that distance at any one given time. So a bullet shot from where Chief is sitting and just pointed at the top of that thing would clear 60, 70 feet of elevation by the time it has traveled, you know, to where the ridge is located. So. Hmm. Uh, that's where that kind of comes in. And once it clears that, and I, you, know, you know, the chances of it clearing aren't high, but they are there. So if they're there, let's not take a chance. Um, and once they clear, from there on, the topography drops back down again. So it's not that there's anything else to stop it once it clears that ridge. Thank you. You're welcome. Molly? I have a couple of quick questions. Um, I've worked with a couple of architects before, so I'm going to ask you probably your very favorite question, which is, sure. having done no work on plans and specifications, can you give me an idea or give everyone an idea of how long a process the firing range folks would be talking about? And really, your favorite question, what will it cost? Just order of sure. matter. Sure, sure, sure. No problem at all. Um, so, uh, you know, to develop a set of plans for for something, and and this is a relatively small range, so it's not too complicated. Um, I'd say you're probably talking a couple weeks, uh, and that would involve the site planning and the architecture and the engineering to support baffles and you know making sure the lines of sight are correct and all that kind of stuff. And that's something we could do, and uh, we or another qualified firm could do in a couple weeks. Um, 
I'd say the cost of that is probably, you know, fifteen, twenty thousand dollars. So my real question was, how about the improvements themselves? Order of magnitude, what do they cost? Um, I'd say you're probably talking about. Uh, <laughs> yeah. uh, Molly's going to hold you to this number. Yeah. I, I just want you to know that we just built a yeah, library. You don't know what she does. We just built a library. We know how that works. Well, I, and we have so much. I mean, I, my head's rushing with numbers because we have so many different examples of ranges, mm -hmm. tactical ranges, and cowboy shoots, and thousand yard ranges, and stuff. I'm trying to think of in a case like this. And, you know, I, and just to put a little bit more caveat on what you're asking me. The, the club currently has a 100-yard range, 100-meter range, and a 50 and a 25, and they're kind of separated into three sections. Um, you know, I think the right way for them to approach this is to try to get the smallest piece of that started, see how that goes, and uh, if that's done successfully, then you can work on the next longer group and the next longer group, so it's a phaseable kind of thing, and you don't open up any more than until it's safe and all that kind of stuff. Um, so, you know, if you just let's just talk about the 25 meter range just for a second, not rather than the long ones right now, and then we can do more math. Um, I think you're probably talking about um, a couple hundred thousand dollars. Okay. And how long would you anticipate it would take to make those improvements? Um, you're probably talking of if you got on it, maybe a month. Okay. And in the longer term, if you were to look at the, the yeah, you could be you match. could be talking about uh, three quarters to a million dollars. Okay. And that would take could take another six months. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, you bet. Now, I just uh, just to add, there are lots of ways to design baffles. Um, and lots of communities, police forces, uh, have access to other materials. You know, it's where we may want to use this, you could also use these other five things, and somebody's going to donate that. Mm -hmm. So it, there's lots of things that affect the price of containment, um, but that's in a, in a general sense, that's about what I would expect that to cost. Thank you. Yeah. Can I ask one other question? Certainly. To, uh, I'm not sure who to ask this question of. Perhaps our attorney or Mike knows the answer to this. The way the ordinance is written, does whatever improvements need to be made, do they need to be made and completed within some specified period of time in order for the club to be fully licensed? Just, just very briefly, in order for the council to grant a license, <coughs> there are certain findings that you need to make. And you know, when you when you're considering the license application, you'll be reviewing those findings. And you know, so some of the findings are, is that you know, you're, you're basically finding that it's safe. Mm -hmm. And you know, in, in order to have the license and have it operating, the conditions need to be in place to support those findings. Yeah, so if those <coughs> improvements took some period of time to be made, the club would not be operational during that period of time. You know, you know, I don't want to prejudge the council's decision because the council needs to make the findings. But you know, I think if you if you read the ordinance, you 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 you'll see that you need to make findings amongst other things that there is shot containment. I know you've gotten a lot of emails on on you know that there needs to be shot containment, but that is language that's specifically in your ordinance. It says that you need to find that the shots are contained within the range. You know, you know, you know whether or not you know, like like every other development proposal, you know, you you you, you know, you, the planning board would approve a development, and then you you have you know, you don't have occupancy, you don't have all those other pieces until it's done. You know, you know, I, I, that that's something the town attorney would need to look at. Uh, you know of, of how that process evolves, but but you know clearly it cannot be operating until you, as the licensing authority, 
find that the conditions in the ordinance are met. Thank you. Okay. Jamie? Yeah, thank you, Mr. LaRosa. Um, I know when uh, Mark Mayone first started discussing uh, this with us years ago, that he did discuss no blue sky baffling systems, and that that was part of the planning process for the gun club. So I just want to make clear that what you're saying is the there's two things. One, which is right now without no blue sky in place, that your recommendation is not to allow live shot resumption. And two, that what you've seen as far as their future plans, that their designs were not sufficient to accomplish no blue sky. And repeat the first one. The first looking. one is that given that there's no blue sky in place, Correct. that you would recommend that there be no resumption of live fire until blue sky, no blue sky is in place. Correct. Right. Yeah. And, and I think, yeah, that's, that's what the report says basically, is that until, until we get containment, we need to cease fire. And the second point being that the design plans that you saw the club put forward on blue sky, no blue sky, were not sufficient in your opinion. Correct. Okay, thank you. And, and again, to add uh, to that, containment can be achieved, and it can be achieved quickly if, in terms of the design. And I think you're, the, if I now go back and think about the question there, it was, and that's a licensing thing and a county attorney thing, I, I, I'm not there. But the idea is, is that if their license is due on the 14th, whatever the vote is, by that time they could present a design, create a design, whether this is useful or not, they could create a design that shows that shot containment can be developed and they're going to implement that. And until that time, nothing's going to happen until that, that is implemented and somebody, myself or somebody else says, that's going to work. And, um, as soon as that's installed, we look at it, and if somebody looks at it and says they're good to go. Just as uh, I guess you know, the the word was ceasefire mm -hmm. was uh, was adhered to. So I think there's that potential. Now, whether that, that can it be built by that time, I don't think so. They'd really have to pour to it to get all that done in a month, basically. Yep. Yeah. Uh, the last question is about calibers. Um, of the guns, so I saw you had charts A and B about handguns and rifles. Were those the guns that are currently at use at the range, or were those just in general? Uh, those are the guns that they were currently allowing at the range. Okay. And so my question is that are there any caliber of guns that you see being used that would not be appropriate even with a no no blue sky arrangement? Yeah, I think some of the some of the higher powered guns need to be taken off the list. That's a pretty typical ac activity at. Uh, at ranges these days is, you know, the seven double lot nitros and, and hot, heavier uh, pieces of, and that would be something that, again, a, a range designer would look at them and say, yeah, let's do this for baffling, let's do this, let's do this for containment, let's do this for ballistics, and basically recommend to the club to put limits on what they're doing and how they're doing it so that it could be contained safely. Okay. Other questions? Caitlin? Um, to go back to the five degrees, it says that it's not significant enough. I was just curious, what um, degree is considered significant? To I'll repeat the first part. Your mic isn't quite. Back to what Jessica was talking about, the, you know, the trajectory and the 8.6% being about five degrees. It just says that that's not significant. I was just curious what is considered significant just gotcha. to be in place. So it's, a, it's more of a... It's, it's lots of factors coming together. I mean, 0% uh, is significant if you have 10 miles downrange. Um, in this situation, significant would probably be 45 degrees uh, or, you know, 100 feet, you know, versus the, the, the 60 or 70 that they have right now. You need, you need another 50 feet on top of that to start to cut down on fire. But it, it's a... It's a puzzle of factors. I mean, it's not, it's not just this, it's the fact that there was no baffling. There's nothing over the berm. There's nothing over the, the firing position. So it's a lot of factors that, that start to say, that's not enough. If, if that's all you got and if things are this close, that's not enough. Uh, you start to take out a couple, three of those factors, it starts to become enough, uh, but you've got to contain it within that. And then, um, just to follow up, you, um Range design, like you obviously, your firm does that. How 
common, I guess, is that to find gun range designers in, in the United States. I mean, you're saying you're working all over the country, so I'm just wondering, you know, is it a common practice? Like, is it finding, you know, a needle in the haystack? Yeah, no, it's not very common. Uh, I'd, I'd say, for the ones I know, there's probably five or six of us that are doing this work. Um, it's, you know, it's, it's probably more of a liability thing than it is yeah, I mean, design. And it's, it's who wants to take the liability for these kind of things. And uh, like I say, we didn't, we didn't say there's a niche that nobody's doing. Uh, <laughs> You know, we started doing this because we were asked, and then we got asked again. And you know, we consult with our legal team, and uh, you know, there's lots of there's lots of language in our contracts when we do designs that uh, is talking about who's reliable for what. The range, like I mentioned, we just did in the other, the newest one we're doing in Raleigh right now, with all this bio foreign company behind it with of X amount of hundred millions. Um, we are 100 percent forever liable. And that's a, that's a tall order. Um, so to take on that order, it is well designed. So there, you know, and, and because of that, it's very expensive. Um, so um, I think, you know, they have a chance here to, to contain shot within their, not only their property, but within the range depth. And uh, that's certainly doable. I know how to, I know how to do that. Um, but it's, it's for them to decide they want to do it and then get on it. And, make that happen. And then I guess for council to decide that that's enough, we believe it, it's done in time, and whatever you want to do from there. But that's, that's not my business. I'm, I'm just here to tell you about this range, what I saw. So. Jim, I think. Uh, in your um, opening um, paragraph, you mentioned that uh, if all of this. You want to know about the quartet, don't you? Well, no, I don't. No. Uh, <laughs> what's going on here? <laughs> not going to go there. <laughs> Stick around, maybe we can yeah, use Maybe later, yeah. Um, you describe, if, if all things uh, are done, um, that this would be an average gun club. That's the word average. You use the word average. Uh, I think I use it as a present tense. Yeah, you said um, basically. Not if it was done, but it is currently. Oh, currently. Yep. Um, so in order for it to be a better than average, Containment. Containment. Yeah, it's pretty. That's the answer. That is the answer. answer. Yeah, it, it really is. They, okay. They're just most gun ranges right now just have a lot of land. Uh, mm -hmm. They don't have neighbors. They, they are doing certain things that nobody really needs to worry about, so to speak. Okay. But as development comes in and more people are, you know, gun savvy or interested in guns, and and believe me, I, I think it's important that, you know, people learn how to handle a gun. Well, you certainly have confirmed that uh, in your presentation here. During the, um, during the process of getting to, getting to where we are today, we've heard a lot, um, and this is, doesn't make it right, wrong, or indifferent, but you know, Mark Mayon has, has talked more than once that has gotten some reaction, or a lot of reaction, that if the gun, uh, the gun operator were to use the, the range as designed, then it would be safe. And the issue of containment being the variable here in terms of being 100% uh, convinced that as designed or required and containment. You know, I, I'm, I'm glad to hear that because I think that that has been one of the major disconnects for a lot of us. Um, and uh, I think you've confirmed it for us today that one doesn't necessarily exist without the other. So. Thank you. You're welcome. Any other counselor questions? <clears throat> no? And mine were answered while everybody else was asking their great questions, so I won't add to that. Um, great. great. Well, then, um, if nobody needs Mr. LaRosa now, then I will just uh, thank say you. thank you very much. Thank you all very much. Thank you. Thank you. And um, remind people that there is a public hearing on Monday, September 14th, um, on this issue. So. Three minutes. And maybe we could take a three minute recess while I think some people probably want to leave. Thank you.
Bündnis. Thank you very much. Yes, we gave him just enough time, so. Thank you all. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. you get a lobster while you're here? Do you have lobster? Not yet. Yeah. Lobster breakfast. Okay, then we will uh, continue on with item 99, which is the report of the planning board regarding paper streets. And uh, I see that Peter Curry and Maureen are both here, so um, maybe Mr. Curry would like to come up and give us an overview. Thank you. Thank you. This, this will be considerably less exciting than the last, <laughs> the last topic. Um, we received your... Uh, instruction on the Paper Street Public Engagement Plan and the role of the Planning Board in that. Uh, we tried, I think, quite hard to uh, deliver on the assignment that you gave us. Basically, what went on, This I regarded this as sort of a top-down look at the Paper Street issue. Um, our staff, and I'd like to compliment the planner on the uh, staff work that was done, it was, it was quite remarkable. We have a spreadsheet of all the current uh, paper streets in town. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, I believe you have it in your report um, looking like this. Indicated are the uh, current status of each street and what type of activity might either take place on it now or potentially might take place on it. We also had a uh, aerial photography of each one of the paper streets with an overlay um, indicating the use. And the typical use might be sewer, water, drainage, uh, footpath, things of this nature. With that in mind, we went right down the list and looked at the current uses to which it was being put or might be put and pretty much determined on that basis whether we thought the paper street should remain, should be retained, should remain in place, or be vacated. Um, by far, the recommendation was to retain because in, in many, many cases, there appeared to be a uh, useful and logical use to which those streets were being put or might be put in the future for the benefit of the town. Another one which is, I suppose, obvious is where a, a paper street was keeping a lot from being totally landlocked. And there were a few of those as well. Uh, we did recommend removal of a few. Uh, we did not expect and did not have a whole lot of public comment on individual paper streets, and we see that as probably happening in the next phase of your three-phase uh, program. We did receive one letter um, on Thompson Road, and we actually changed our decision um, based upon the logic of that letter and actually applying the logic to the entire street, not just the, the parcel of the commentator. Um, so you have before you, I think, our recommendations. Be happy uh, with Maureen's assistance to answer any specific questions you have. Um, Thank you. Um, counselors have questions in reference to this? They're maybe catching up. Um, why don't, before we take the questions, I'll just ask, because I forgot at the beginning, is there anybody from the public that would like to speak to this issue? No. Sir, were you going to speak to this issue? George, she wants to know if anyone wanted to speak Did you want to speak about this issue, sir? No, I got the one on it, but I was just trying to get a copy of what he's Oh, okay. Referencing. All right. Thank you. Then um, I... Okay, thank you. Um, then I will go back to the counselors. Uh, questions for um, Peter and or Maureen. Um, uh, 
Jessica, sorry. I have a comment. Um, I read through this and <clears throat> I'm pretty familiar with the issue in general, but I just would like to commend the planning board for uh, spending a lot of time looking at every single one of these in a very comprehensive manner. So thank you. Okay. Molly? Uh, and I'll reiterate that and also add the Conservation Commission because I know they've done a lot of work under this one. Okay. Thank you. Jim? Uh, I, I watched the last meeting um, where uh, you folks took your final vote and moved it on. And the, the fellow from Edgewood Road that talked to the group, I, I, minutes have been included in your packet. You had um, some uh, testimony that you were going to provide to us that might be useful down the road. That was a okay because they, you know there were people that didn't realize this was happening and sort of came out at the eleventh hour. And as we move to the next phase, we want to make sure that we include that discussion, if we will. Um, and I know that uh, there was some conversation that evening for the first time, actually. Sure. No, I'm happy to provide you with the individual cases of people who've contacted us with questions and, and thoughts. We did, in a couple of cases, recommend that they go to the neighborhood event because, and also to put their comments in writing and have them, you know, structured and, and, and be as persuasive and complete as they can. But we'll certainly give you all the uh, input that we've, we've had. Okay, great. Thank you very much. Other counselor questions, comments? Amy. Yeah. Hi, Peter. Um, so, see, the vast majority of uh, the recommendations are to retain Correct. the paper street. And so, if you could just like give us just a real brief summary of like whether it was a uniform thought process on the ones that you've decided to vacate, or that you're proposing that we vacate, uh, the rationale behind vacating certain ones. Uh, I'm not sure. I'd say there was a uniform thought process on the ones we recommended to vacate. There weren't that many of them, and I would say the common thread would be we couldn't see a good substantial reason to keep the paper straight. Uh, Maureen, you can probably have a more elegant uh, explanation, but where there was a arguable good reason to keep it, the street, we recommended retention. Where it just didn't occur to us that there was any good reason to do it, and that there would be no disadvantage to the town or the surrounding community to vacate it, <coughs> All things being equal, I suppose we'd say, yeah, let's let's vacate it just because it has no reason for being. Mm. And did you only recommend vacating uh, Paper Street in the situation where someone requested vacation? Uh, no, I, no, we, I don't think the somebody's request really had anything to do with it. Okay, because I, no, I just wonder why yeah. we why well, did it end up vacating something if there was no request for it. I mean, well, if, if you look at the current status column in the spreadsheet, you'll, you'll see the, the ones where we talked about um, vacating. Uh, usually, the, the, well, um, uh, U21-1 Dearborn South Road, there was basically nothing to report on current status. So the recommendation was vacate. There, was, there seemed to be no substantial reason to keep the paper street. And sometimes the reason to keep it was, was pretty obvious. And sometimes it was a little bit more theoretical, but you could see sometimes there, there might be a connection to a walking, a hiking trail, something like that, uh, where it would be a little bit more tenuous, but still, you know, it, it had some substance to it. If there was no uh, identifiable reason to keep the paper street, then vacating just seemed to make sense. Any other questions? No? Then um, can I entertain a motion that the town council acknowledge receipt of the report, thank the board for its considerable work, and refer the recommendations to a town council workshop to be scheduled? Jim? So moved. Thank you. Is there a second? Oh, Molly? I'll second that. All right. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, any other questions, comments? All in favor? Six to zero. Okay, then we'll move on to um, miscellaneous technical amendments review request, and I might ask poor Peter and maybe Maureen to come back. 
uh, for the miscellaneous technical amendments review request. You want to do that, Maureen? Okay, great, thanks. Public yes, sir, did you want to speak on this issue? I just was wondering when the next, when this paper street one was next to go to, you know, the we'll workshop. The It'll go to a workshop, but we don't have the date yet. Okay, so how do we... When, you, when we get a date, just keep checking the website because once we have a date for that workshop, it'll go right on the website. The Cape Elizabeth .com. Yeah, well, like, do I have to check it every day? No. no, no the, the, go ahead. Might, yeah. the, the earliest possible date, it would be is September 10th, okay. but the council has four topics already scheduled for that evening, and after earlier discussion this evening, there might maybe a fifth one, so that one might slide off. We don't know. Yeah, sure. Good question. Maureen? <clears throat> okay. So, um, you know, you're pretty familiar that you've been getting a lot of ordinance amendments lately, and um, I'd like to suggest we might have one that's a bit of a sleeper. Uh, the technical amendments is a recommendation from the planning board to just do a cleanup package of amendments. Um, it's not intended to implement the comprehensive plan. It's not intended to make major policy changes. It's basically un intended to clarify existing provisions. I, I will invoke protect the public health, safety, and welfare provisions. And also just to improve our customer service by making our existing regulations clearer. So we've made a list here of, you know, what happens is as staff implements um, the ordinance, people come in with projects, we apply the ordinance, so we kind of go, oh, that, that's kind of a problem. And we keep a running list. And we do these technical amendments packages every once in a while, and the suggestion is to authorize the planning board to do another one. Uh, we've given you a list here of what we've come up with so far. And frankly, since we did the list, I have two more items. So we are asking that you authorize the planning board to go ahead and do some work on this, uh, not to limit them to just what's on this list. And in fact, if you have other thoughts, feel free to throw those in their direction as well. Other questions? Any questions? Okay. Um, then uh, does somebody want to make a motion to authorize the planning board to do various ordinance te technical amendments? Molly? So moved. Thank you. Is there a second? Jessica? I second. <laughs> and questions, comments? No? Okay. All in favor? Great. Thank you very much, Maureen. Thank you. Okay, moving on to item 101, uh, which is the Eastman Meadows Affordable Housing Units recommendation. And Mike, I believe, is going to address that. Yeah, I'll introduce it. If it gets too technical, we may have to revert to Maureen. Uh, back in the early 1990s, the Town Council had an Affordable Housing Committee and they looked at different ways of providing affordable housing. And it was the desire of the council then, and it was enacted into an ordinance, uh, that in essence, as, as new developments were proposed, they would try to be a set aside of so many affordable housing units, depending on the size of the development, and also dependent on whether or not there would be low income uh, housing units or moderate income housing units. It, it's like anything, you know, it, it, it's worked somewhat well, uh, but it's also had its problems. Uh, for example, the old Leighton Farm uh, on Wells Road is one of these units. There's a couple of them in Cross Hill. Well, it, it can't, you know, with, within the ordinance, there's a provision that the developer can attempt to sell these things and, you know, to, to utilize the affordable housing provision and to market it, to show example of marketing, but that it comes a point that after it's put on the market so long, and there aren't any takers, uh, the ordinance has the provision that the developer can do an affidavit and said he's done this or he, she's done that and come back to the town and say, you know, I just can't sell these. I want to offer them to the town to buy them, uh, which is the town's right. There's a provision and there's a proposed draft amendment that our, our special counsel for affordable housing, uh, uh, Maurice Cito Selinger, uh, came up with that, that, that basically, uh, you know, the, the developer in this case, Eastman Meadows LLC, I think it's called, uh, you know, has said, you know, they've tried to sell it, they can't market it. So what the option is, is, 
you say no, but that may not be keeping with the ordinance, but you might, there might be some other option that you can think of. Uh, or under the ordinance, the, you authorize us to sign this waiver. Uh, we do that, and then the, the two units that are involved here could then be sold to non-qualified buyers at, at, at market rates with any excess over, believe it or not, these, these are affordable at 395,022, which is, I just can't believe that. Uh, and, and that might be one of the problems. I think if people are gonna spend that amount of money, they don't wanna have all these, all these strings attached. Uh, but anyway, so if this would allow the developer to sell them at market rates and under the ordinance, any excess over the amount that they'd be able to sell for, uh, which is 395,022, be, go into some fund for affordable housing, uh, be set aside for that. I, I, I do, you know, we would put it into a fund. We don't have any specific proposed use for those monies. Uh, but, you know, but conceivably, you know, this, this could be, you know, in, you know, 30, 40, 50,000 each, uh, that these, based on what these other units are selling for, that would go into a fund. So my recommendation is that you do waive the town's rights to purchase two affordable housing units that have remained unsold for some time. And uh, otherwise, and, and within that, uh, uh, operationalize the provisions that are in the current ordinance. The, the other piece is in, in your previous item with technical amendments, this is one issue that's going to be looked at, needs to be looked at, is how, how are the technicalities of this ordinance working? Uh, and do there need to be changes in order to, to make it uh, have the intended effect of providing additional affordable housing units in town. Great. Questions for Mike? Yes, Molly? I have a quick question. How did that figure, how, how did we arrive at that number of 395,022? And how did, how did anyone define that as affordable? Yeah, it's, it, it, you know, it's determined by, a, go ahead, Maureen. It's, it, basically, it's determined by your ordinance as a percentage of, of average, and she'll, she knows the details better than I do. So it's the provisions you have, I just want to say, the affordable housing provisions Cape Elizabeth has are the envy of many other communities. So you should be proud of your ordinance, but it might need a little tune-up. Uh, so the number comes from, in the ordinance, we do not put an exact dollar amount because obviously within a year or two it's out of date. We have a definition that says moderate income is affordable to families within 80 to 150 percent of the median income for the Portland area. And then we lean heavily on the Maine State Housing Authority, who actually cranks the numbers for us. So they give us a low income number and they give us a, a moderate income number, both income and affordable home. And that's what we uh, provide to sellers of affordable housing for them to sell the homes at. Yes. So that number would be the same if the developer were selling a unit in Scarborough or South Portland or Portland. It really depends. It actually depends on what their definition is. Um, some communities base their definition on the median income for the community. At the time in 1992, when Cape Elizabeth adopted this, they felt that they had already done a report that said you had an affordable housing problem. And to tie your income to Cape Elizabeth didn't really get at the problem. Mm -hmm. So your definition says to the Portland metropolitan statistical area, any, er, anyone who uses that as a reference is going to have the same number. That seems very high to me. Well, and, and I agree with you. And when, in 92, when this was written, um, the state had some guidelines for affordable housing. And they said, they had originally said moderate income was between 80 and 120. And the values in southern Maine were so robust that they actually allowed communities to define it as 80 to 150. And it was in that period of time that Cape Elizabeth adopted the ordinance. Since that time, I, th I really think we need to look at that 80 to 120 again. Mm -hmm. um, and it may be that just changing that definition to 120 instead of 150 could make the moderate income hit a, a market that we're not hitting. Because right now, the moderate income is really bumping up against the market rate, mm -hmm. which isn't really dealing with the original intent of the ordinance. Right. And uh, I'm sorry, Mike, did you just say that this would be considered under the technical amendments or that it 
would be added to that? Or, yes. Will be. Thank you. Thanks. Other questions for Maureen? Okay. Then um, I would ask for a um, recommendation or a motion to waive the town's right to purchase the two affordable housing units at Eastman Meadows so they can be sold to non-qualified buyers at market rates. And then um, anything in excess of $395,022 will be provided to the town for other affordable housing. Jessica? I so move. Thank you. Is there a second? Sure. Thank you, Jamie. Any discussion? All in favor? Yeah. Great. Okay. Item 102, demolition of bleachers at Fort Williams Park. I think maybe Mike, Mike was going to start with this. Yeah, just at your workshop last month sometime, I don't remember the exact date, uh, you received a report on a proposed amphitheater which would go I would call it behind home plate on, on, on the playground. Uh, and you know, the, when, the, when the council heard that, they, they, they looked at it and you know, thought it was a good, interesting proposal. Uh, they uh, asked that, you know, could it possibly be done in phases to demolish the bleachers first and to uh, you know, look at the amphitheater when, when more monies are available in the Fort Williams capital account. Uh, so anyway, it was, the consensus was to go back to the consultant and find out you know, what, how much it would cost to, to just take out the bleachers now, uh, and to also ask the Fort Williams Advisory Commission to look at it. As, as the notes indicate, the Fort Williams Advisory Commission did that. They submitted a recommendation. Lise Pratt is here, uh, could discuss, the chairman of the committee could discuss the recommendation. But anyway, the cost, the cost to simply remove the bleachers came back. This is, this is an estimate, a budgetary estimate, at $120,000. Uh, we also had, you know, sent an email or uh, there was communication with the high school principal and others indicating that this might have some impact on graduation. And, you know, knowing that that, that concern was out there, uh, through Bob, we went, we went back to John Mitchell, the landscape architect consultant, and asked, uh, you know, well, what if we kept that section where graduation is, the, the lower bleachers, and took out the rest of it? And, John, I expected more of a report, but we got a couple of sentences, uh, which we distributed the Fort Committee into the Council, I think, on Friday, uh, maybe it was Thursday. And basically, that said it'd be $15,000 less than the 120. So that's, that's an outline of where this stands. Okay, thank you, Mike. Lise, did you want to add anything to that? You know, I have prepared remarks, but Mike has pretty much covered it, so I don't want to take up time that's unnecessary. Okay. Certainly, if you have questions. All right, then uh, throw it back to the council. Questions, comments? <clears throat> yes, Jessica? Um, if we left those bleachers in that section in, and it would reduce the cost by 120,000, 120, do we know what it would cost to take those out at a later date if we decided to? Do we know what it would take? You know, I, I, I've wondered the same question. I mean, if we save the 15000 Right. What is it going to cost you us know, my, my, my sense is, is that it, it's, it's probably, you know, on the one thing, you, you, you're restaging it at a different time. But on the other hand, you're, you're dealing with a much more manageable piece. And, you know, I don't know if it's something that we could do, you know, at a much lesser expense. I don't know that. I bet, you know, I, I, I really don't know. My, my sense is, it's, it's probably six of one, half dozen of another. Uh, but you know, it, what, we, what we're left there is a lot more easy to deal with than taking out you know, the big rise and the rest of the bleachers. You know, if we did our own trucking, you know, which is easily doable with, with uh, you know, the, the smaller bleachers, which where it's, you know, would be real difficult to do with the, the whole mass of them. So, you know, it's, I, I don't think there'd be a substantial cost savings or, or, or increase by keeping those uh, bleaches other than the 15,000, you know, immediate savings. Okay. Um, maybe Lisa, if anybody else can refresh my memory, what was the cost going to be for the amphitheater? And has any look been into, like, similar to the question of will the 15,000 go up? The, the doing them at the project at the same time. Is there any cost savings in 
taking the bleachers out and putting the amphitheater in at the same time, or is it two completely separate projects and there's no way to save any money? I wish I had more specific information about that because we have not done, you know, we haven't worked those numbers specifically. The original number, now I don't have my notes with me, but it was close to half a million dollars for the entire proposed project that included the demolition and the construction and some of the amenities that we were talking about. Um, I think that um, in separating the demolition from the construction, my assumption always was, and we got confirmation from um, John Mitchell while we were deliberating months ago, um, that if it, if it was phased, there would be overall an added cost. Um, but what that difference is was never specified. Um, I think in this case, um, because we won't be revisiting the same area and undoing anything that was done, it, there probably isn't a terrible overlap of labor, but um, it, it always costs more to mobilize twice as opposed to once. Um, I don't know if Bob has anything more to add to that. I hope that answers your question. Um, I just want to, I guess, add, now that I'm up here at the podium, that um, the message I received from you all at the workshop was that um, you wanted to take care of, address, eliminate the safety issues um, that were present um, with the deterioration of the existing bleachers and that you had concerns about the liability um, that would remain um, with the town if it wasn't addressed while we continued to work on this project, which looked, um, looked now to be a year or two um, out in the future given the planning process and the budgeting process, planning board review, et cetera. Um, so I just, I just want to remind you that if you do choose um, to keep this piece um, of the bleacher there, that the liability and safety issue has not been completely eliminated. There'll be some there. Of course, that's your, your judgment. We have not met as a group since uh, we approved this recommendation, which is to eliminate all the bleachers. Um, so I have no response from my group in terms of this other option, um, but I guess for the purposes of tonight, our recommendation stands as presented. Can I just have a follow-up question? Yep. yep. Was there any other discussion about the safety and the liability other than demolishing, de demoing the tire bleachers? I mean, was there any workshops or brainstorms on to other ideas on how to repurpose them, make them safer without demolishing them? I'm just thinking, we can't just order the demo without, I um, imagine, having a public hearing and listening to the public on what their thoughts are on getting rid of these, you know, these bleachers that have been there, you know, forever. So I'm just wondering what we can say back to them was, here was five options discussed and, you know, was, was there any other thoughts on how to improve safety or eliminate liability? Just if I might. You know, we've had Fort Wayne's advisory commissions for a long time, and uh, they've recommended several times that we do repairs for them. And I don't know if you've been down there lately, but it's the, it, they only last so long. It's, uh, you know, they particularly, not, not so much the smaller bleachers, but the larger bleachers are, re are really falling apart. And, you know, it, it's, I think, you know, the community, you know, needs to, you know, do you want to more invest in something that has huge elevation issues and will continue to do that. You want to, you know, if you want to reinvest in those bleachers, you know, you can do that. I've, I've just never, in recent years, you know, when people have actually looked at them, seen support for throwing more money at those existing bleachers. There was a, asking if the Fort Williams yeah. There was a study that was done in 2009, I want to say, by Renner, and anyway, there is a study. And even then, um, the recommendation was not to try to repair or rehabilitate the bleachers, that it was a losing battle. Um, and I will be, I'm, I, yes, I know that uh, we've worked on this bleacher project for a year now as a group and have considered four different plans. 
None of them have included salvaging, repairing, keeping any of the current bleachers. Every one of them has, without discussion, I might add, I mean, I don't remember any debate about it, um, all, of, all of those plans have included the total demolition and removal of the existing bleachers. Other questions? Molly. I have a quick question on the consideration of leaving some part of the bleachers for graduation. Is there a possibility of leaving a different section of the bleachers that is in better shape or less expensive to keep? Bob can, Bob can address that because I had nothing to do with the option. Okay. The, the section on the easterly end or the very end towards the parade field parking lot, those are about the best shape. <laughs> That's the section closest to the water, where exactly. they hold Looking graduation. at the bleachers from the baseball diamond, the parade field, the section to the right, those are in the best shape. Okay. They're in the best shape, and that's what's proposed to be kept. That's in, an option in, for you to consider. Right. Yeah. Okay. So the, the issue, as I understand it, on safety has to do not so much with whether the bleachers are deteriorating, which I think you've just spoken to, in fact, that that's been taken care of periodically over the years. But there are also issues with differences in elevation heights or how they're structured maybe. There's really, a, there's loose concrete. Some of the risers have actually, they're spalling or falling or cracking off. Uh, so if you look at the sort of the middle of the, the, the bleachers there, there's sections that have just, the face of them has fallen off. Mm -hmm. So if you walk on them, there's loose concrete in several of the sections. So if someone was walking up and down, it's not really the height of the risers, it's really the composition of the concrete, which I think was made from, they said made, was made from beach sand. It really isn't concrete like we know it today. Right. So it's very brittle. You know, the, the height, if I might, the height of the risers has been there forever. But if, if you look at, you know, modern construction standards, you're not gonna do, do a riser that has that much of a step. And in some places there is that much of a step. It's very uneven, but, but you know, that, that problem's been there since the day they were built. Caitlin? And the demolition of the bleachers and any projects, I guess, and anything after, you know, the grassing, the grading, that's not going to, I guess, take any steps backwards from any <clears throat> forward momentum with any amphitheaters or whatever else gets decided to be done over there, is that correct? It, that's to my knowledge. It's just really to stabilize the slope to what we call a four to one or a slope that could be maintained. Uh, some fill would be put over it, but it wouldn't uh, have an impact on anything done in the future as far as any conceptual designs. Other question? Molly. Sorry to come back to this question again. So if we keep the section to the far right, mm -hmm. most easterly section, where they hold graduation, mm -hmm. and we save $15,000 on the total demo. Do we then still need to put some money into those bleachers to repair them? There's a couple of bad sections on either end of that section. That, depending on the time frame of the new plan and implementation, we might want to think about doing some very cursory repairs, possibly, but. Not in the $15,000 range. No, but it's, it's just a choice. We'd have to look at that to see. Well, yes, and then there's a railing that once you've, if you decided to leave that section, there's a railing that would be needed on the westerly end of it. There's a railing that's currently there. It may or may not be able to be reused. We don't know that. Yeah, just if I, there's probably about a five-foot, six-foot section that you might want to reform and, and put some concrete. It's not going to last too long. You know, and, you know, you're talking maybe a thousand... I don't even think you're talking a thousand dollars. You're talking a lot less than that. But you know, if you're going to keep these smaller bleachers, there are some, particularly for graduation, there are some minor repairs that that ought to be done before you you put a hundred of oh, Cape Elizabeth's finest young people on there. I agree. So what we're doing, I mean, what I'm looking for from the council is um, to, a decision of what which way you want to go. So you know, a motion to. Um, remove all of them, or remove some of them, or whatever your heart desires, so. Um. Are we doing a budgetary allocation right now? These monies would come out of the Fort Williams Capital Fund, and you had, during the budget session, you had discussed that, you know, once there was some more look at this, that you'd revisit those monies. 
there's plenty of money in the Fort Williams Capital Fund uh, to do this. They had originally proposed uh, for the bleachers this year, a couple, couple hundred thousand, was it? 250, yeah. So, you know, that was considerably reduced during the budget process. But there are funds in the Fort Williams Capital Fund, should you wish to do this. Caitlin, you had a question? Oh, I was just curious, the timeline, sorry to keep asking questions, the timeline of if we decided this tonight versus in a month from now, um, do we lose any momentum? Do we do we lose any foothold in getting the project no, accomplished? That's probably a question for probably. you. I, I don't think so. The idea was when contractors were looking for winter work, this might be a good project that might be lucrative for them. And so the work involves, you know, crushing and demolition. Um, but I don't think we're going to lose any ground if it's 30 days from now and you make your decision. It would be something that would be programmed this winter. Are you looking I, for additional information? Is that what you're asking? Yeah, well, I'm just thinking that based on what I saw on the agenda, I would be inclined to think that most of the public did not think we would be making this decision tonight. And I'd be interested more to hear from the public, just, you know, considering we've been discussing open process, you know, for the last few weeks. That's all I was saying. So we'll go back to the council. Does anybody want to make a motion? Chairman, Jessica? I have another question. Yes. Yeah. This is actually for the town manager. Yep. I don't remember the, the communication from the school department. Would you please do you just remind us what that what their <coughs> position was? I mean, it, it wasn't from the school department. There was a there was a response from Jeff Shedd. Okay. And he was informed that this would probably, if it was demolished, that have to find other alternatives in order to deal with graduation. And he basically responded that he, he wasn't very happy with not having graduation there, that it was a thing that people, you know, like to have. Well, it hasn't been going on forever. I mean, my son graduated right next to the high school in chairs. I mean, they don't, they haven't, this hasn't been a 25-year thing. It's probably been 15 or 20 years the graduation's been there. Mm. And, and so if there were no bleachers, they certainly could put chairs out there, could they not? Well, they, no, there are lots of other options. You could move in temporary bleachers, there could be, you know, but repairing those bleachers, you know, at, a, at you know, $500, $1,000 to have them there for a couple of years would be less expensive than some of the other alternatives. You know, if they, if they want to have the, the event in Fort Wayne's Park. Amy? So was the, um, maybe for Bob, was the estimate internally done or was it an outside person that came up with the estimate? Uh, John Mitchell, the consultant oh, for the committee yeah. prepared that scope. So I, I'm, my guess is that it was based on the amount of, you know, crushing and it's probably a cubic foot measurement, all that sort of stuff, estimate. So it probably would be the same cost to remove that, you know, on a per cubic foot basis down the road. So uh, um, I understand Jessica's concern, but I think it probably won't be much of a difference. I mean, there could be some additional mobilization depending on, we leave the means and methods to the contractor, whether they bring in a crusher or they demolish on site and truck it away. So it really depends on how the contractor would approach it. Uh, given the, you know, how much extra that would be. But there'd be another mobilization to perform that task. Right. We don't know what that amount would be. Probably wouldn't be much. Does the will of the council have any ideas? You're just too tired to think I, anymore. I don't have a problem with Caitlin's suggestion. If, there's, if it's not pressing, if, the, if there's going to be any more public feedback for the next month, we can address it then. You know, I, I, I do caution the council at the September meeting, you have another item on the agenda that uh, will take hours. So, yeah. We never have that. <laughs> well, we could receive, we, we would get the word out there that this is an actual, you know, we're making this decision one way or the other. I just, I, I don't think it was clear to m most of the public that, you know, this decision was yes or no tonight. So I would just be curious to see what we get in the next month for emails, communications, you know, corn purchases. What? People who stop by the farm just to talk to me. They always 
by a green bean or something. Just so can... Well, then does anybody want to make a motion this evening or Jessica? Well, I, I don't see this as an issue that requires waiting. I mean, it's been on the agenda. I don't, I mean, I, I don't agree with Councilor Jordan. I don't think we need to um, wait for public input or comment. I just don't see this as particularly controversial or expensive or anything. So are you making, uh, I'm sorry, just a second. Jessica, are you making a motion? Uh, sure. I move that we. Before oops, you do that. I'm sorry. Jim? Um, since the. I mean, uh, Jessica does have the floor. Is it all right to speak for him? I, I give the floor to Council Walsh. Okay. Sure. So based on what Michael just explained about Jeff Shedd's uh, response, the, uh, the advisory commission hadn't taken a position on that last section that was just presented to you tonight. However, the Advisory Commission has had conversation about how important this site is to our graduation and the traditions that have been established. So while they don't have a vote to either support or otherwise that recommendation, it has been discussed. And it is an important piece of all their deliberations because they're very concerned about the tradition that has existed there and want to continue with it. So. I just add that as a another piece for considering the one section and and possibly modifying it. But again, I understand the whole issue of public process and input and having it out on the airwaves so people can talk about it. But at the same token, you know, we have been uh, deliberating, as Michael indicated, for years on the disposition of these bleachers. So. Then back to Jessica, you had a motion, I think. I move that we uh, accept the town manager's recommendation to, if I'm saying this correctly, to demolish uh, most of the bleachers but retain the section that uh, is used for high school graduation. Okay. Is there a second on that? Holly? Okay. Additional discussion? I will ask if Caitlin wants to move the table just as a motion, but. J uh, J I'm sorry. Caitlin? Thank you, Jamie. Yes, I'll move to table Jessica's motion to next meeting. Can I have a clarification on what that means? I'm too new to the council to understand what just transpired. Mm -hmm. So, do you want to Please. Yeah, you know, if a motion is made to table, it's not debatable. Uh, and it, it effectively kills the proposal. If, if, the, if the motion is to table to a date certain, uh, that, that's a possibility. And, you know, I didn't, I didn't hear that as, as part of the proposed motion. So, is the tabling? Oh, she said to next meeting. Michael. Did she? I she didn't said to that. next meeting. Yes. Do we vote on whether it's tabled or yeah, there's if, no if, if, there, if there's a second? So the next question is, is there a second to the table? Uh, second. Jamie, okay. thank you. Okay, so this is not debatable. All in favor of tabling? All opposed? Okay, we'll go back to the original motion, do we not? Or do we? Yeah, that's what's on the table. Okay, so we're back to the motion that Jessica made and Molly seconded, which is to demolish everything except for the graduation bleachers that we understand is about a discount of 15000 on the $120,000 uh, cost. That can be discussed. Discussion, Molly. I'd just like to add to that that we need to be sure the bleachers do need to be repaired in that section that's being held on to that that happens. I think you if, would, if, if the plan is to keep that, we'll, we'll look at uh, some temporary repairs. Because, you know, my guess is they would still be in place for a couple more years. Thank you. Question? Yeah. Is there a plan for the softball field bleachers? Are we going to be looking at installing temporary bleachers for people to continue <coughs> to use the softball field? I know a lot of parents use the bleachers, whether they're unsafe or not. So I'm just wondering what the continued policy will be for use of that field? 
You know, I, I would, you know, I think that's going to be an issue the Fort Wayne's Advisory Commission will deal with, but, uh, you know, I have not heard any discussion of the town providing temporary bleachers. Other questions? So all in favor of the motion um, to demolish except for the graduation ones? All opposed? Six zero. All right. We made it through that one. There we go. Okay. Thank you. Um, then moving on to item 103. Um, Order. Does that release, does that include the funds for it? Okay. Yeah. Yes. I assume you're getting up for a reason, Jamie. Because it yes. is my right? Right. 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 And do we have to vote to agree? Um, Jamie Wagner is going to recuse himself, wishes to. Does the, um, so is the council in agreement with that? Yes. Yes. Mm -hmm. okay. Um, okay, so uh, we're looking at the proposed lease agreement of space at office building at the front of the community center. Um, is there a motion? Caitlin? I move to approve the lease agreement. Okay, is there a second? I'll second Molly, discussion. Jim, um, do we have um, do we have all the information on this particular property, rent stream, is is it current? All those. Do we have do we have that information? Michael, what, what do you ask? Well, is this is this um, is this tenant um, current? No, they're not current. Okay, so. Do we do we authorize a lease under those circumstances? Or how does it well, work? That's up to the council. The our lease, our different leases provide that uh, payments are due in the first of the month. In the case of this particular, the, the lease that was expiring, the July uh, rent payment has not been made, nor the August. Okay. Go ahead. What's yes. our policy? What's the town's policy in such cases? Well, the, the policy is stated in the lease agreement that the, the rents are due for a certain time. The practice is that when rents are past due, uh, the facilities manager contacts or someone from his office, I'm not sure if he does it or someone else does, uh, generally will contact the person who's, uh, uh, you know, who, who's the leaseholder to say, you know, you owe some money, get it to us. Sorry, I just chair was pulling. That's all right. Um, Caitlin, has that happened, or could we ask the tenant why he might? You know, be in this instance, it's happened a number of times over the last couple of years. Yes, that uh, calls have been made or emails sent up. I'm not sure the method of communication. There's been, you know, a number of times that the lease, that the rent over the last two years in particular has been two to three months late. Uh, it's generally, I, you know, I, I don't know if there's been a month in the last year that the rent has been paid on time. There, could, there might be one. It's generally paid two or three months at a time. Jim? Well, uh, can I move to table this to our next meeting for more information? Or? Well, I would give you information. Okay, I'm just. Uh, Cheers. What's the desire of the council? Well, somebody I has to second the table motion. Right, I realize that. Jim well, made a, a table motion. Is there a second for that? Jessica? I'll second. All right. Um, then we would uh, vote on the table um, maybe to, to gather more information and come back next month. So, um, am I correct that we vote on the table? Not debatable. Not, pardon? Not debatable. Right. So, all in favor of tabling the motion? Opposed? Okay. We'll table it till next month and we will um, gather more information and come back for that. Can I speak to that issue? No, so I don't think we can. Now that we're on or not to the table? 
rates of people read the lease and what the default provisions are in here? That the, in an event of a default made by tenant and the payment of rent were due, the tenant shall have 15 days after receipt of written notice to cure, in the event of a default made by the tenant and any of the other covenants, et cetera, et cetera. So I, I, I do appreciate that I just voted in favor of tabling because I do think it's worth having a discussion at some point in the future, but I do want to point out that technically, think that tenant is not in default until that is passed. Right? Michael. Yeah, just on that point, a few months ago, I did, I'm not sure there was discussion, and I'm not sure if a default notice was sent, not, not for the current period, mm -hmm. but you know, early there was one and the default was corrected. Uh, you know, I think you know, the, the real point at this point is, you know, do you wish to renew the lease? It's, uh, you know, and this also does involve a little bit more space than the previous lease. So, you know, I, I would have to consult with an attorney to uh, look at those particular issues. I think that's probably worth having some input yeah. for us for the next meeting so we understand the implications. Right, and we've tabled it so we can gather some additional information before next meeting. So, you know, I, I, I will say this. You know, I've tried to, because of the awkwardness of this, yes. I've tried to have someone deal with it, who's not me? Uh, you know, when, when you have someone who's, you know, a leaseholder, who's also one of your, your seven bosses, it's, it's awkward. So Greg has generally handled the, the details on this as he does for all the other leases. I think that's very reasonable and very well done. Um, I will ask, I will just move that we are going to look at there's citizen opportunity again for discussions not on the agenda, and there's nobody here. So before we go into the uh, poverty abatement um, request, I will just say publicly that we're not going to come back into public session, are we? Or yes, you are. We are because we have to vote on that, but there will be no additional business. It won't be televised. It will not be televised. Okay. Great. And, so and the only item will be the vote, the yeah, vote on yes the poverty no. abatement. Yeah. Right. Okay. So we'll move on to item 104. Um, and does somebody want to make a motion um, with the right citations? Jessica. I move that we enter executive session in conformance with one MRSA section 4056F to review a request for poverty for a poverty abatement. Thank you. Is there a second? I'll second. That. Thank you, Molly. Um, any discussion? All in favor? No one's recusing themselves. I have to recuse myself. Oh, no, I'm sorry. But, uh, um, yeah, go ahead. Personal friends, go neighbors on. with the uh, person requesting the debate. Okay, so does any, the council is okay with his recusal? Yes? Okay. Great. Then we will go to the Jordan Conference Room and we will get through this item. Oh, yes. I, I can't vote on it, so. Yeah, but he can't vote. No, he can't, oh, no. So he, he's, he's, he's done. He's done for the yeah. gets to leave, yes. 